Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on strategies to keep up with rapidly changing laws for medical and recreational marijuana. Today, we have a great team from the law firm of Barnes and Thornburg to help us navigate the complexities of this issue. My name is Dolores Alonzo with FPSA, and thank you for attending. This webinar is being recorded, so it will be accessible to any of your folks unable to listen in today. It can be found in the members only section of the FPSA website, and the slides are also included as an attachment for your reference. In addition, there's some information on our cost savings legal services program sponsored by Barnes and Thornburg. The firm specializes in many different practice areas, so feel free to reach out to the team if you would like more information. So before I pass this over to Barbara, we encourage you to ask questions and you can do that easily by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send them in anytime during the presentation. Um, I think that's it on our end. So let's get started. Barbara, I'm gonna pass this over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining us to discuss this very important and complex topic. I am pleased to have two of my uh, best law partners with us today, uh, Norma Zeitler and Bill Nolan, uh, both of whom practice within the labor and employment area, who have uh, dove in headfirst uh, in preparing for today's webinar. And as Dolores said, we welcome your questions throughout the program. I'll be moderating and we'll get as many questions in as we can. Uh, I know with this topic, as we typically say with legal topics, um, they're never your questions, they might be your friend's questions. And when it comes to marijuana use, that may be even more the case. Uh, with that said, I want to turn over to my law partner, Bill Nolan, uh, to introduce himself. Bill? Yes, thanks, Barbara. Um... Good afternoon to most of you, maybe good morning to a few. Uh, Bill Nolan, and uh, as Barbara said, I'm in the labor and employment law practice, been doing that for 30 years, and I'm in Columbus, which is sunny Columbus today. Hi, I'm Norma Zeitler. I'm also in the labor and employment group, and I am resident in Barnes's Chicago office. I focus my practice on advising employers, uh, primarily in manufacturing and nonprofit industry, on the full range of employment issues. Great. Thank you, Norma and Bill. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to speak today regarding both um, legalization of medical marijuana as well as recreational marijuana. And we'll start by uh, talking a little bit about the legalization, just in general, Norma, of marijuana at the state level. So at last count, all but nine states have legalized marijuana in some fashion. There are three basic approaches that states take to legalization. Removal of criminal, criminal penalties or decriminalization. Complete legalization, so that's recreational use uh, by adults. And legal, legalization for medical purposes. And, and the other thing I, I like to mention at this point, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but one thing that I think it's not going to be intuitive to a lot of you, unless you, you know, happen to have read specifically about it, is that you need to be aware of disability discrimination laws in your states, and uh, I believe all, all 50 states have one, and uh, probably have some familiarity that those laws have a requirement that you reasonably accommodate people with disabilities. And in, in this case, um, while uh, if someone's using medical marijuana, they probably have a disability, uh, as that term is defined under under any of those laws that I know of. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that that courts are doing uh, in that regard. Not not lots of them, but a few. And that we um, that you need to be mindful of that potential legal obligation as well as you go forward. So there are a few moving parts here. So that's why I just want to kind of mention up front. And we'll we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit more. So just to um, sort of give you a little more, expand a little bit on what Norma said is what different states are doing. Um, you know, here is a list of states. So you can look for yourself or multiple states, as, as the case may be, for, for some of you as to where you are. So uh, slightly more than half of states have 
decriminalize the possession of small amounts of marijuana. So uh, at some level, personal consumption is uh, at most sort of a, a minor misdemeanor. So that's that's a lot of a lot of states, as you as you can see. Bill, I have a it's Barbara. I have a question. Uh, uh, obviously, here in Illinois, with uh, the recreational use. Uh, becoming effective this January. Lots of questions on the decriminalization. If if one of our listeners has an employee who had previously checked a box on an application saying that they had a conviction um, that now is subsequently would be decriminalized, what if any obligation does the employer have in that regard to correct that a notation? Is there some process you might recommend in terms of um, you know, human resource folks updating these records? Yeah, so in, in other words, in terms of, hey, you ask a question that maybe it was a felony when you were, you know, when you were convicted in college, um, but it's not now. Is that, is that what you're saying? For, exactly. For example? Yeah. Exactly right. With the records being kind of expunged, um, they, you know, is there a possibility of going back uh, to that per employee's file and, and somehow noting that it had been, yeah, I think where it could, and you know, Norma, you should chime in after I do. The um, I, I think where it could, where the only scenario I see it maybe being significant is in the is in the hiring stage. Um, I don't see it. You know, if, if once someone's on board, I don't see a scenario where there'd be a need to go back. Um, and it's a great question. Uh, I mean, generally, you're not supposed to ask about things. You know, the, this would be a webinar unto itself about things that are too far in the past, but you could have a scenario where the law changed relatively recently, um, and the nature of your question is, this would be a common question on application, if you've been convicted of a felony in the last seven years. Yeah, that's often the way it's done. Something could have been a felony six years ago. Now it's not. Uh, I don't know, I don't know specific cases on that or uh, and background checks are an area where lots of states are active in a statutory yeah. way as well. I, I would, I think, as an employer, uh, my first reaction would be, well, it was a felony when you did it, so it's a felony. Uh, I haven't seen it come up. Do you have a different feeling on that at all, Norma? Well, let me chime in. So in Illinois, um, the recreational marijuana law is going to specifically, and it doesn't become effective until January 1 of this coming year, but it will specifically decriminalize things and um, allow for expungement. So what I anticipate might happen in Illinois, for example, is an employee may come to human resources and say, hey, by the way, um, this may have come up on my background check. It's no longer a crime. I would like, like my file to be annotated to show that that is no longer a crime. And as an, as an employment uh, lawyer, I would say, absolutely, you should make that annotation because, um, you don't want an adverse action to be taken on something like for a promotion or anything of that nature for something that's no longer a crime. Um, the second thing that I'll mention is, and, and again, this is outside the scope of this webinar, but um, in some states like Illinois, you can't even ask questions on the application about convictions. We have banned the box legislation. So right, um, right. I know in Ohio, you, you may not, Bill, but uh, for those employers who are out there in other states, just be aware that that may be a question that can only be made post offer. Uh, so anyway, I think in Illinois um, it, and in other states where um, it's been decriminalized, if an employee comes and says, hey, can I, can I correct my personnel record? I would certainly recommend allowing to do that. I think mm -hmm. it's sort of the fair thing to do. Yeah, and that also speaks, as you both pointed out, as to updating applications to the extent they raise those issues. We had a question from one of our uh, attendees today uh, that has, uh, they have offices in multiple states and you have a marijuana personnel policy because it varies from state to state, you know, could the employer, just by virtue of having a policy, which might be okay in one state and not okay in another state, how, how would you recommend managing that, Norma? I would recommend for any employer on the line um, to pay particular atten attention to what's going on in their state with respect to these marijuana laws because it's rapidly changing. And um, if you have a policy that takes an adverse, that, that results in an adverse action being taken against an employee because of the use of marijuana, uh, you should have your policy reviewed for compliance with state law. 
because even if you, if your headquarters operations are in one state and you apply a policy to an employee in a different state that would be illegal under the law of the second state, you could still be held liable under the law of the second state. And so you have to be very careful in that regard. So flagging certain policies as applying to particular states would yeah, be a good strategy. Or changing the policy to comply with the state that's the most uh, permissive. And so we'll, we'll talk about that later on when we, we talk about the checklist of things for employers to consider. Um, but I think, you know, for folks who have operations in multi-states, think of leave laws, think of um, all of the other laws that vary by state. This is the same thing. Uh, and so you're going to have to take a state-by-state -state approach to this issue in the future. Yeah, so Norma, think, on, excuse me though, go ahead. Yeah, if I may, um, just real quick. So the, and, you, and Norma, it's right, we've got a checklist that we think will be helpful in this regard. Um, and I would just add, I, I think you know, if you have more and more employment law is happening at the state level, and you know, I think those, probably most of you on here, if you have interest in this. And so, when, you know, Barbara, going back to Barbara's question, background checks is a great example. Um, and as are the, the marijuana laws, and, and Norma said some others, and I think drug testing is one that I remember grappling with for clients, you know, probably longest ago. So this, this sort of question, it's a great question from the attendee, which is, hey, I'm in multiple states, how would I balance these things? I mean, there's a lot of strategy to that, is that how you want to do that? And as Norma said, it's just going to, it's just going to increase, so. Yeah. And, and I suspect, of course, that's going to increase as we go to that second strategy, Norma, which is the states now that allow recreational use of marijuana. And we have a map just to show you, Norma. Um, we're flagging the green states here. Uh, these would be the ones as of which, what day, I guess, coming up on Illinois being January 1st of 2020. Well, actually, Illinois is included. Um, this is as of August 1. Uh, and, and what it shows is states that have passed legislation allowing for the recreational use. So Illinois' law doesn't go into effect until January 1, but everybody's gearing up for it. Um, and so this state shows where it's currently uh, legal. Now, if we look at the, the, the medical marijuana, I know it's much it's a much broader state. We've got a variety of shades of green here, Norma. Could you flag those for us? Or, or Bill, could you kind of walk us through those yeah. different colors? Right. Here? No, no, that that's very colorful, um, as you as you say, and, and it's interesting um, because um, and I first of all this this website that is referenced here, NCSL, I think I have National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, gr great resource and not just for lawyers, for employers as well. I mean, on areas that you can uh, get just tons of things like what you're sorts of things we have as far as what different states have. And so, um, you know, this is interesting in, in part because uh, two states that I know better, I mean, I practice in Ohio and um, in Pennsylvania, and, you know, and those are, I know enough to know there they're different, <laughs> there are differences in those, and Ohio is just kind of getting up and running now. Um, but, you know, ultimately there is, you can imagine there are a lot of of course, a lot of politics around these things as well. Um, but you know, gen generally speaking, and, and I don't profess to be an expert on all all 50 of the states, but um, you know, comprehensive green, comprehensive medical cannabis program. Uh, but still, in, in Pennsylvania, for example, there are very specific reasons that you have to have that have to be the basis of getting mar medical marijuana. So there's still a lot of regulation around it. And not only in the employment side, by the way, um, you know, there's a lot of regulation around who, who can be, who can dispense, who can grow it, that sort of thing. So uh, this has divided it into um, several different kinds of programs, and uh, it, they call the, the green the most, uh, the most comprehensive, which is which is what they call it. And there you can walk in the stores, and you've got the card and authorized. And register and, and you just buy it. So, uh, but don't. I guess what I'm saying is, don't get fooled by the uh, too fooled by the group of colors because you can 
B, think, oh, I'm all in this sort of color, so we'll just do that. It's still going to be very state by state, but this is a nice sort of breakdown. Yeah. So for those of you who have the multiple offices in different states, uh, uh, your head may be spinning, and you may be at the point of saying, Norma, uh, what does this mean for our policies? As one of the, the earlier questions talked about, uh, what what does this all mean? We have different you know states on all different levels, um, and even their particular laws vary um, from one another. So. What about a workplace drug policy? I suspect many of our, our listeners have those policies right now, but what's the impact, both in terms of the medical as well as the recreational? So all under, under all of these laws, employers are going to be able to prohibit working under the influence. Um, and so just as you can prohibit working under the influence for alcohol, the same is going to be true for marijuana, whether it be recreational marijuana or medical marijuana. Um, you will be able to prohibit possession on premises. Um, you know, I think in states like Illinois, where possession is going to be lawful, it's going to be important to have policies that, that specify what you will and will not allow as an employer. And, and finally, um, all employers obviously can comply with federal law. Um, if you have drivers uh, who have to have a CDL, for example, uh, you can comply with Department of Transportation regulations. Um, there's, and, and there are actually carve outs in, in the various laws for compliance with um, either state or federal regulations and laws. Yeah. One of the questions, so I, Norma, specific to Illinois. Oh, oh go ahead, Bill. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think, I think it's, I'm, I'm a big fan, um, you know, I'm a big fan of not of the employers not freaking out um, just because it, does, it doesn't help you and, and ultimately over time we see that hey we, we do get through these things and manage and, and we don't go out of business because of a new law even if it may be inconvenient and, and an additional layer I'm not not minimizing it but you know, I think it's just important to sort of stare at these three bullet points for just a minute and um, you know understand here's some things that I, we haven't seen I don't think we will see um, Chipped into, so we got some really basic stuff here. We we still got that um, that is good that is good and important. So go ahead, Barbara. Thanks. Yeah, I know we had a thanks, Bill, and we had a, a question come in uh, regarding Illinois specifically. Um, Norma, would you suggest taking marijuana off pre-employment testing? I think most uh, lawyers in Illinois are grappling with that issue, to be perfectly honest, and um, we're we're waiting to see if regulations come out on that on this, um, because there's a little bit of a conflict in the law, and we have some slides later on. But um, you know, certainly the safest thing to do would be to starting on January one, not do pre-employment tests for marijuana, um, and and also. Um, the same is going to apply, I think, to random testing once an employee is employed. Um, and we can talk about why as we go through the slides, because I think there's a, a slide a little bit later that addresses that issue. Can you slide down to see that? Yeah. So one of the one of the other um, questions that I had, Norma, um, was the concept, of the first bullet point uh, as to employers. Um, prohibit employees working under the influence. My, my question was, how do I know that someone is under the influence of marijuana? Um, perhaps, you know, we've all perhaps been trained or aware, or supervisors may have been trained and aware on things like alcohol use. But uh, I know in Illinois, you've mentioned that there are specific behaviors that are in the, in the law that you could look to to say, yes, I saw this behavior in this particular individual. Is that correct? Yeah, so in Illinois, for example, um, the statute actually identifies symptoms that uh, employers may consider in determining whether an employee is impaired. Um, and, and those are things like symptoms that, um, that the employee exhibits that would tend to decrease or lessen the employee's performance, slurred speech, issues with physical dexterity, agility, coordination, change in demeanor, irrational or unusual behavior, negligence or carelessness in operating equipment or machinery, disregard of safety, um, involvement in any ac accident, 
that results in serious damage to equipment or property. For those of you out there who have uh, drug and alcohol policies, that probably sounds a lot like what you look for when you do reasonable suspicion testing. And so I, I think what the Illinois General Assembly tried to do is codify what many of us have been practicing for ages, and that's you have to look at the employee and see if the employee is behaving in a way that doesn't make sense. And if that's the case, then you document that, and um, perhaps that's the reasonable basis for sending them for a drug and alcohol test. Yeah, and then the, you know, the documentation, and, and this goes back again as we keep talking about the importance of keeping up on the state laws and the training. Bill, we've had some questions uh, come in with regard to some of the folks listening. Uh, their company may be owned by a company that is a non-U.S. company, uh, so they may have a presence within the U.S., but in one example is given, uh, they may have a presence within Canada. Um, Canada has its own, I know, marijuana laws as well. Uh, how do you break that down for our listeners in terms of, you know, any exemptions or any exceptions, if you will, because a company is owned uh, or operated in a different country but maybe does business with U.S. or has employees in the United States? Yeah, and no, I certainly uh, welcome Norma's thoughts on this af after as well. Um, but I mean, generally, most you know, most of these laws, um, and, and a lot of these, the marijuana laws aren't employment laws per se, but they have these employment-related components. But uh, it's, it's generally going to define an employer as uh, as who is covered by the law or the, the part of the law, and. Um, you know, it's generally going to just come from do you have employees in the state? And if, if you do, um, I don't know of anything that, the fact, where you might where you might be owned um, and um, or you know, what your presence might be. But if you have employees who are resident in the state or sometimes, of course, that in itself can raise other questions, which is, well, you, how much of the year do you need to be resident? Some states answer that specifically. And regulations, but I don't know of anything just because you're, say, foreign-owned um, that would get you out of this. Do you, Norma? No. Uh, in, in fact, if some if a, a business is licensed to do business in the state, um, they're going to be subject to the laws of the state. Yeah. I, I see a question about um, whether a company can be banned from doing business in the states um, based on the sale of um, equipment that might be used in, in manufacturing or processing of marijuana, that, that's a little outside the scope. Believe it or not, we actually have lawyers in our firm who advise employee uh, companies on marijuana laws. And so, um, you know, if whoever sent that question in, if you want to email one of us, we could connect you with the right person. Yeah, and, and it does raise the issue, though, let's say, Bill, you know, at the federal level, marijuana is still illegal, right? So, you yeah. know, as we talk about cross-border transactions, so to speak, uh, or we talk about, you know, well, the federal law says we can't do it and the state law says we can't, how are, you know, what, what is an appropriate way to look at that from an employer's perspective? Should we ignore that fact at the federal level and focus solely on the state? Should, should not ignore it. Um, and you know, one of the things, and it, it, it's interesting, so you'll have, um, You'll, you'll have situations, and, and the tide seems to have turned, like anything else. We'll see if it's, it's permanent or, or otherwise. But uh, there was a period where cases would come up, and employers would, and this is probably what we would have advised, too, which is, hey, it's illegal under federal law to, you know, to manage your liability as a, as a company. Uh, safe thing to do is to fire someone. They're, they're violating federal law. And as we gradually get more and more of these marijuana laws, and as I mentioned, occasionally under the disability discrimination laws, you're seeing courts say, yeah, we see what federal law says, um, but we're, we're not going to, I'm going to oversimplify more complicated principles. You know, that doesn't preempt um, the state law, which provides, you know, provides the right to use medical marijuana under these limited purposes and uh, we're going to, notwithstanding what federal law says, we're, we're going to recognize certain rights people have under these laws. Um, and some of these laws specifically uh, will, will say you can't fire someone.
someone because of use of medical marijuana. So you know, it strikes me that something, I don't know, Norma, that may ultimately percolate up to the U.S. Supreme Court to, to sort out a little bit. Um, but I, I think from an employer standpoint, and, and this, this analysis may vary state by state a little bit, uh, depending on if, if it's a state where there's a emphatic decision one way or the other. But uh, certainly don't recommend just you know pretending it's not out there because it is. And the views of it, of course, change from administration to administration how things are going to be enforced as well. So you've got that that so, additional. So me, no, I've already used this term. That additional moving part as well. So let me jump in. If if there is a specific federal law that an employer must comply with, and that law prohibits the employer from keeping it in, in its employment yeah. an employee who uses marijuana, whether it be for recreational or medicinal purposes. If there's such a federal law that applies to a particular employee, then the employer is going to be able to terminate that employee uh, based on any of the laws that I've seen because there's a carve out that allows employers to comply with federal, with other right. federal or state laws. So yeah, the yeah. medical marijuana laws, the recreational use laws, they don't preempt federal or state laws in that regard. The yeah. problem comes yeah. in when there's no, no such law. Yeah. Right. right. The problem comes right. in when there's no such law. In those instances, um, it, it's going to depend on what the law in the applicable state says. And I keep coming back to Illinois because I sit here, and frankly, it's one of the most progressive and comprehensive that I've seen. But the law in Illinois, um, the, the Cannabis Act, and it, it, what it actually did in addition to making recreational use permissible, it also amended the Lawful Use of Products Act to, oh, it's actually um, a law that allows for permissible use of things that are legal. So courts were saying, we're, we're finding that these um, laws only apply to um, use of products that were legal under both federal and state law. And so employers were being allowed to terminate employees because this product or this drug is illegal under federal law. Illinois changed that and said, if it's lawful under state law, which marijuana now will be, then you can no longer discriminate against the employee because of that off-duty use. And that really leads us to that next slide about um, what it means for drug policies. And, and one of the questions that came in um, as well, uh, so if, if you're in a state, you're an employer in a state, Illinois example, uh, that allows recreational use, uh, could you still require job applicants to be tested? And if marijuana was detected, uh, can you refuse to allow them to be considered for the job? And this is among the big questions, right, as you just said, Norma, with the off-duty use. It is, and, and I will tell you that the law is not that clear in Illinois because there are provisions in the, in the law that, that state explicitly that an employer can enforce zero tolerance policies in the workplace. And then when you look in other sections of the law, it states that employers can't discriminate against someone for the lawful, for the use of lawful products, which is in, in, in conflict. And how we are interpreting that so far, in the absence of any guidance from the regulatory agencies, the interpretation that we're given that is that you can, an employer can enforce a zero po tolerance policy in the workplace, which means if someone possesses marijuana, if they are found to uh, be in violation of your policy while they're in the workplace and you have a reasonable basis for testing them, then you can enforce your policy. And so there's a question about whether, you know, you can do pre-employment testing. I think that's going to be risky in states that have laws like we do in Illinois, effective January 1. But with regard to particular types of jobs, Norma, um, that would be so someone who's a forklift driver, someone who's a school bus driver, et cetera, has a commercial driver's license. Um, there may be obviously those areas in which testing would remain required 
Sure, and, and you can still test for any other substance. It's just that, that marijuana is going to be an issue. Um, and, and if you're permitted to, to drug test and, um, and marijuana is, remains on the list of prohibited drugs for that particular license, then you can absolutely still test for that. Yeah, and, and among another question that came in was um, with regard to different you know products made out of marijuana where THC or other components are in them, um, even even used through vaping devices. Um, I had raised the question to you both regarding edibles, and so with regard to policies uh, or and or coverage the, it, with the Cannabis Act, at least here in Illinois. It, 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 it applies regardless of the form of the marijuana, is that correct? So, so what happens is the, the, the drug test that you test for marijuana tests for THC. And, and so that's the metabolite, I think is the correct term, that the drug test looks for. And it looks for it at um, some cutoff level. Um, I think the federal level is like 50 NLs per mg. Um, so there are cutoff levels, and it looks for a particular substance. Um, edibles may or may not include THC. Um, hemp oil and, and some of the other CBD. CBD um, supposedly, um, CBD is now considered a supplement, and it's legal in many states. And supposedly, CBD, if used in the... Um, according to the manufacturer's instructions, does not cause um, a positive test result because the level of THC in the CBD is not high enough to hit that cutoff level. But it's a supplement like any other supplement, and so it's not a regulated product. And, and I've read that people have indeed tested positive on drug tests for use of CBDs, which, which is a whole nother issue. Um, and, and really, I think that's the problem, one of the main problems with marijuana. There currently is not a test in widespread usage that allows an employer or law enforcement or anyone else to test for impairment. You know, unlike alcohol, where you can give someone a breathalyzer and you know what their levels are, um, what you test for in, in marijuana, you can find out the level but you don't know how recently the person used it because of the length of time that it stays in the body. Yeah, and that, and that raises the issue, Bill, um, as we go on to the next slide, really talking about how is that zero tolerance? If I'm an employer and I have a zero tolerance policy, presumably you might try to, to govern what I do after hours or off duty. Um, yet, for example, if I'm you know, over age 21 and I need to have a glass of wine after work, that may be okay. Are you going to also prohibit me from um, imbibing in, in marijuana uh, now that it's, it wouldn't be criminalized in some way? Uh, how, how does the employer grapple with that particular issue? To Norma's point about uh, marijuana, in many instances, staying in, in systems longer and, and sometimes that different forms of it, like edibles, uh, staying in systems longer. Yeah, in general, you just you know, for the next couple slides, they're going to track those three nifty maps we had earlier on. So remember, this was the first one where we've got a little more than half the state uh, decriminalizing. And um, and so, you know, I, I think it's going to, I'm not generally going to suggest to employers um, in different, what different states do about it or say about it may be different. But, uh, you know, I don't think I would personally generally be suggesting to employers in, in a state where the use is legal um, off off hours, then they're not under the influence at work, and one of those you know another thing that lends itself to some level of interpretation. Um, so it's not it, it generally there's not a specific protection that you can use it off duty, but um, yeah, I, I think it's just going to get get complicated. And some states will have predating uh, all of this, you know, all of this these marijuana related statutes uh, laws and I know you know Illinois has addressed this specifically but I don't think that's true in all states um, that you know, prohibit active taking action against an employee for lawful off-duty conduct so um, you know I don't know if the two of you see scenarios 
I mean, it just strikes me as not a good use of an employer's energy to try to, to regulate something that's lawful after hours. Do you guys feel differently about that? I, I, I guess I can, I'm a lawyer, I can I can argue <laughs> three sides to the, to one issue, right? Depending on who's paying the bill. <laughs> um, you know, I, I could, um, for, I, I think the way that I, I have uh, come to grips with this is it, it, it depends on what the risk is. So if you have an employer and the employer um, has a lot of people operating heavy machinery, then I might be a little bit more aggressive in my yep. advice in, in yep. what kind of policy that employer ought to have. If I have a bunch of tech workers uh, who are basically sitting behind their desk coding, um, then I'm probably going to let them do whatever the heck they want off duty as long as they don't bring it onto my premises because number one, um, you know, there's a, there's a labor shortage out there. And so I don't want to screen out what might otherwise be qualified applicants. So my answer is, is it's going to depend on who it is I'm advising and what types of jobs they are, they, their employees are doing. Um, I see a question about uh, expungement and taking criminal charges of possession off. So if generally when, when something is expunged, there will be a court order. Um, and so the, the employee in that instance could bring in a court order and, and give it to you. Um, I, I'm not sure I would require something that formal in a state like Illinois. To be honest with you, I haven't studied the uh, the part of the statute that applies to decriminalization. The, the statute in Illinois is 610 pages long, and I've I've studied in detail the employment sections and some of the other sections, but um, I'm not sure what the process is going to be for for getting um, those for your previous convictions off. Uh, my guess is it's probably going to be an expungement process, but it could be something less than that. Right. And and just looking at the next slide on, on the recreational use, again, going back to the three prongs at the outset, um, again, on the zero tolerance policies, we talked about varying by jurisdiction. Uh, and again, I think we're struggling to the point you've, made, you've been making about um, pre-employment testing uh, and then uh, on the job random testing uh, as to particular types of of jobs, um, which may be that exception from a from a practical standpoint. Yeah, and 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 also I think that um, the way I synthesize all of this in my mind uh, is that if you have an employee, forget the pre-employment and the ran, random testing, um, because a lot of employers have stopped doing that anyway. Just because um, for a variety of reasons, but put that off the table and put it aside just for a moment. As an employer, what you really care about is how your employee is performing the job while at the workplace. And if there's something that's interfering with that employee's ability to do his or her job, it doesn't really matter to you as an employer what that issue is. You need that issue to be fixed so the employee can perform. If you see weird behavior or strange behavior that would cause you to suspect them of being under the influence, whether it be marijuana, opioids, alcohol, whatever, then and you have a policy pursuant to which you've given employees notice that they can be subject to reasonable suspicion testing, then you can test them. If you find that their levels are above the level that's permitted under the applicable state law, because that varies by state as well, and you give the employee an opportunity to challenge that test, um, usually that's done through a medical review officer. Say, for example, the employee says, by the way, I have a medical marijuana card, and here it is, um, and that explains my positive result, or I take ADHD medication, and that's why I show positive for amphetamines. Whatever, whatever explanation they want to give, if you consider that explanation and you still decide that they should be terminated after you've talked to your lawyer uh, because you're kind of in uncharted waters in some respects, then you go ahead and make that decision. And then you're not making the decision based on, you know, prohibited reasons. Yeah, Norman, you mentioned in, in looking at the next slide that medical marijuana aspect to it. And, and you made the point quite clearly, which I think is very an effective 
filter, and that is someone being able to perform their job. And Bill, that really does lead to so much of the foundation of ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, a federal law, but as you've mentioned earlier, we have those state disability laws as well. So to Norma's point about those job functions, how do you see that interfacing again with a zero tolerance policy? Yeah, um, so you know, I think this is an area where, I mean, I think employers you should put on your sort of accommodating disability hat here. And I'm not saying you're gonna do exactly that, but I just want you to sort of think in that framework. And this isn't, uh, as the first bullet on this slide says, this isn't from a federal Americans with Disabilities Act standpoint. I don't know of a case um, you know, where under the ADA, uh, because it, marijuana, and, and Norma made an important distinction, I think it's worth just saying again, you know, marijuana is, I mean, I think there are two, there are two kinds of federal laws here. One is, I mean, there's just a criminal law that says, you know, marijuana is illegal. Um, but the other, she mentioned, there are laws related to certain industries and job functions that you know, pr prohibit you from hiring someone. And so, to, you know, the, those are both out there. But these aren't. This, is, this isn't a federal law kind of issue. But every state that I know of has a discrimination law, uh, often not a separate disability law, but rather one that includes sort of the various kinds of prohibited disability. And I mentioned earlier. I mean, we actually hit a lot of this in response to some of these good questions um, is that if you if you can get medical marijuana under the regime of a particular state almost certainly you have a disability under the disability laws because you've got some serious uh, medical issue of some severity and of course the whole whole range of those but really unlikely that you wouldn't be disabled for purposes of that law and so you know, what we're seeing and why, you know, I'm not talking about two thirds of the states or anything, but seeing in the last few years some courts saying, okay, despite, and I'm, I'm not talking about those situations where, oh, you, you're, you have to drug test people and there's a federal law that says that. I'm talking about just the general illegality of, of marijuana under federal law. And they're saying, despite that, um, our state discrimination statute requires to reasonably accommodate people with a disability. This person's got a disability, so at, a, at least you have to start to go through that process, that dialogue, and that consideration. Um, it doesn't necessarily say what the outcome is, and those of you who work with reasonable accommodation kinds of issues, you'll, you'll know um, it tends to be very gray and depends on the particular situation. So, you know, just telling employers to have that in mind um, and um, you at least think about that process that you might, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to fail your drug test because I take medical marijuana, um, to get, even if your position is you, it, that we don't want to employ those people, at least touch base with counsel about the possibility um, that, gee, maybe we at least go through some information gathering process before we make that decision. Now, the third bullet, just, and then I'll, um, you know, hand, hand it over, um, is the, there are also, and this is different, a different kind of state law. These are the ones that specifically address, and I, I'm looking at New Jersey just passed one, and this has this. They say you can't penalize an employee for being a medical marijuana user. So, so the medical marijuana law actually contains a quote unquote, um, you know, just anti discrimination provision against such people. So it can come up in both of those ways, but we're seeing courts shift to how from cases that where they originally um, used to looked at it and say, okay, yeah, we see the federal law, but we're, we're going to do this anyway and give the employee these rights here. And, so, and that would give rise, Bill, um, on that discrimination just as would any other type of discrimination? Um, well, it, yeah, it could, it could of be one of two things. It, it could be one of two things. Yeah, in effect, yeah. So it could be one of two things. One would be um, a disability discrimination uh, I was discriminated against on the basis of my disability because you didn't go through the accommodation process 
uh, regarding my medical marijuana. And those, those are terms that will sound familiar to the attendees who, who work with those issues. The other is, and as we've been saying all along, you know, these, each one of these laws looks a little bit different on the medical marijuana. The other would be that you violated the medical marijuana law, which says you can't take an adverse action against somebody for using medical marijuana. Yeah. yeah. So, Let me so jump in. Some will probably think of something different. So, but that's that's where it is now. Let me jump in. I I think um, it's it's important to mention because of. Okay. So you can't take an adverse action because of a disability or because of use of medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, maybe. But you can take an adverse action against an employee because of. Um, you know, bad performance or bad behavior or things of that nature, even if it's caused by, you know, use or the disability, you just have to consider, if we're in the ADA context, whether, what, whether it would be reasonable to, you know, excuse the conduct or whatever. And so it, it's in, in the medical marijuana context, if you have an employee who tests positive, um, it's the same reasonable accommodation analysis that you go through for any other type of disability. Uh, and if, if they're telling you that they have to smoke marijuana before they start work, at lunchtime, and after work, and they operate a forklift, then it's probably not going to be considered to be reasonable to right. allow them to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so you go through that type of analysis. Um, the other thing is, and, and I think Bill mentioned this, but... Um, Illegal drug use is not protected at all under the ADA. So if someone brings a claim under the ADA because of an action, the, the federal ADA, because of an action based on use of marijuana or any other drug that's illegal under federal law, that claim gets dismissed out of hand. It's the state disability laws, like Bill talked about, that are going to give you reason to have to have these conversations about reasonable accommodation. So we've we've covered a lot hey, of hey, Barbara. Yes, hey, Barbara, please go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to jump in, but the, the only thing I would say is I think some employers in in some. See, I would I would suggest because you don't know which state the court might take that view I was taking of the disability law. So I I think it's good to go through the information gathering process. But I think in in many some employers could reasonably decide. Okay, let's get this information. Think about this. Um, and we're going to something not as extreme as the example of smoking before work, lunch, after work. You might reasonably decide, hey, we're, we're going to take the chance under our state's disability law um, not to make this an accommodation. So I, I think you could do that. Um, I think that, which is a little different. You don't really have the option, um, and you would rely on that federal prohibition. So e evolving, right. but I just think it's, it's not a hundred percent mirror image. Yeah, absolutely. No, good good point. And, you know, we've covered a lot of territory. And um, as we recap things, uh, we, we provide in the last couple of slides for you a bit of a checklist of considerations. Um, as you've heard over and over, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. And I know a lot of you are, are still struggling, particularly when you have uh, offices in different states, et cetera. So, Norma, we kick us off. We'll walk through these quickly but and, and encourage folks um, as uh, Dolores said at the outset, our handouts are available in the PDF uh, portion there, so please feel free to share those with your colleagues. But this is a good checklist, Norma. I think the first bullet on this one is, you know, ask, is really whether the, the workforce or your workplace is governed by any laws that actually require testing. Right, and, and we talked about that a little bit earlier, and I see a question from someone that, that may be asking a question that's prompted by Drug-Free Workplace Act. The question on the screen is, um, you know, what if a client in another state says, um, requires um, the employer to drug test its employees and the employer is in a state that doesn't permit such testing? Um, I, I think in that situation, you need to go back to the client and ask the client where that requirement is coming from because, um, you know, we can't opine on, on you know, directly workplace acts in, in all of the states. but. As a general proposition, they don't generally require testing. Some some employers have built that into the policy and call it a drug free workplace act. And so I would go back to the client and ask that question. Um, but certainly, 
you will, you as an employer are permitted to comply with all federal and state laws. And so if you have laws that say you need to drug test your employees, then you need to drug test your employees and, and, and there will be an exception. There should be an exception in your state law that covers that. Um, to me, the bigger, the bigger issue and, and where you ought to start is what is your company culture? How, how do you want to treat this issue as a company? Um, do you have potential safety concerns? Uh, do you have forklift drivers? Do you have people operating heavy machinery? Um, and and then you need to look at your applicant pool. Are you going to be able to have the kind of applicant pool that you want if you do pre-employment testing? Um, for those of us who have been around the block a few years, um, we probably have different views on the subject of marijuana use than than the young people who are coming out of high school and coming out of college and who have grown up in an era when it isn't as much, uh, it's, it's not as taboo. And so I think you have to think about those things and, and decide as a company, what do you want your policy to look like? And, and looking down that checklist as well, Norma, um, even if you were to have a drug testing policy, um, again, you know, looking at the the, the options on the next slide, uh, you know, what type of uh, what type of policy or testing do you want? And obviously, you've shared a couple of those, and we've talked about you know several types of testing, some of which may be some of which may be at a higher standard. To your point about the applicant pool, if I were to test only in a circumstance of um, reasonable suspicion, that's a higher level. I'm not. I'm not keeping people out the door Correct. versus the pre-employment. And, and you could still do pre-employment checks and, and just take marijuana off the, the list of things that you test for so or, or any other lawful subject uh, substance. Um, you know, one thing that I haven't seen many people writing about in Illinois um, is, is for the employers who don't have drug testing policies. I actually think it's going to be really important for employers who don't have policies to adopt policies to make clear that um, if that's what the employer decides, that they don't want marijuana on the premises. Uh, because you have to approach this with the mindset in the states where recreational use is allowed, starting on whenever the effective date of that law is, this product is just like any other lawful product. So in Chicago, for example, as I'm walking to the train, starting January 1, there will be people walking down the street smoking marijuana, just like they smoke cigarettes. And so you have to change your mindset and realize that it's not going to be illegal and think about what policies you need to put in place because you are permitted to keep it out of your workplace. Yeah, and that's, it's a good point. And, and as we wind our time down together, I know lots to cover here. Uh, and Bill, looking at the next slide, um, you know, we've talked already about the, the what not what being one size fits all in the policy. I think Norma makes a good point. Again, we have that struggle with a multi-state employer. And to Norma's point, if you don't have a policy, this is an opportunity to create one. But Bill. You know, as you advise clients when, with offices in different states, how, how do you, how would you recommend approaching that? Um, yeah, as and, about? yeah, and I'll tell you, different different employers just feel feel differently about this, and it's, not, it's hard to generalize. You know, you just got to sort of play it out. I, I just would say it, it's daunting, and understandably, but I, it's also one of those things <laughs> you can do it because because we've done it before and in other areas. Um, it's it certainly it's attractive, of course. To have one policy, and I think good experience counsel can can write a policy that weighs these various things. Um, one thing I don't think we've said is you know, the language, um, you know, to the fullest extent allowed by law. By the way, is, is very useful language in policies sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that's a good might. catch all. Yeah, Bill, that's a good catch all statement as we wrap to that last slide on the checklist. Uh, not yeah. to sound self serving, but uh, checking with counsel because um, some of those catch alls, Bill, um, would, would, you know, uh, alleviate a concern with a particular policy, right? Yeah. From a, yeah, no, from that's a right. Standpoint. 
Right. So, Bill, I think you would agree with this from a policy standpoint. That's true, but you're still going to have to know how to administer it within the various yeah. states. Well, right. And, and sometimes I've, I've seen employers in other areas, and you've got it or sort of basic policy that says that. You might even have an, just a little one-page addendum that you have in certain states, you know, so the managers have that to work from. But yeah, you're right, Norma. I mean, you got to you got to train your people how to do it as well. And, and I think that's a really good point. So, if you think of this as just another handbook policy, which quite frankly it really is. People put their drug test policies in the handbook. If you think of this as just another drug hand, or handbook policies, policy, then you can approach this in the same fashion as you would any other laws that are governed by state law. So if you have a one-size-fits-all handbook, then you probably are going to need to have a policy that follows the law of your most permissive state. If you are one of those employers who distinguish from one state to the next based on state law, then you're going to need um, an addendum or addenda, probably several, <laughs> given all the states. And so that's that's uh, going to be hard to manage, but it, it's the, the land that we live in. Yeah, and I think keeping abreast, um, as those of you who do uh, on your state laws as they continue to change will be important training of supervisors. We talked about before employment to application testing, obviously during employment, and then even post-employment if there was um, a termination or other action there. Um, I know lots to consider, and uh, the good news is um, if you'd like to hear more from us, uh, we are delighted to be at Process Expo next month, which will be here in Chicago. I say next month. It's actually in October, um, but we're getting close to September now. And our team will be out in full guard. So if you happen to be a Process Expo or a colleague will be there, um, please look for us. Um, we can always continue this discussion uh, as things evolve. Uh, we're, we're all on the same footing, I think, when it comes to that. And with that said, Dolores, I'm going to turn it back over to you for final wrap-up. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much um, to the Barnes and Thornburg team. As Barbara said, reach out to them anytime. And like she also said, they'll be at Process Expo in exactly 43 days, not that we're counting, in booth um, 3549. Uh, so thanks also to the attendees for all those terrific questions. Um, we appreciate everyone's time and thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.